everybody, I am Matthew Miller, the Fedora project leader, and this is a Fedora Council video meeting. Uh, as I always say, but maybe it's the first one you're watching, uh, we try not to conduct our business in meetings at all. We try to do it asynchronously because we're a global community that is hard to get everybody together for one meeting. But we also find value in the high bandwidth connections of meetings and occasionally in actually literal high bandwidth video meetings where we can talk back and forth. Particularly about once a month, we do a thing where we pick an interesting section of the project or something that needs help or something we uh, want to focus on or something that's going on that we want, uh, we invite members of that part of the project to come and give us a presentation of what they're doing. Uh, kind of basic thing is what's going on, um, where are there problems where you could use help, what the council could do for you, and you know other future plans that sub-project. Uh, so today we have Stephen Gallagher representing ELN, uh, which is a sort of new sub-project in Fedora that's related to the production of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and I will let Stephen give you the details for that. Welcome, Stephen. Thanks for having me, Matthew. So. Uh, First of all, uh, yes, I'm going to introduce uh, Fedora ELN to those of you who uh, either haven't heard about it yet or don't know much about it. Uh, to start, uh, to start uh, we generally do try to refer to it always as Fedora ELN because it is very important to us that this is part of the Fedora project and not a uh, third party, uh, not a RHEL project or whatnot. So let me just, I just realize. So I'm noted, I will make sure I, uh, Put that in my uh, what, what, my rules for saying words. I guess that part of my brain. <laughs> uh. um, so I hope my presentation is coming along for the recording. Yep, looks good. All right. Uh, so as uh, as we like to refer to it in the uh, in the uh, ELN SIG. Uh, we call it pulling putting the relish on the beefy miracle. Uh, so some of the viewers may not be familiar with that old uh, joke, but uh, we once had a Fedora release that whose code name was Beefy Miracle, um, and it became kind of a meme of its own in the in the Fedora community. So when we when we came up with this idea to start actively developing uh, Rel in Fedora more cl and more clearly delineated. The, name, the term relish kind of came naturally. So let me. So let me talk a little bit first about the history of how Fedora become uh, became Rel. So with Rel eight as as my example, and for and for Rels prior to that, what we would generally do is we would stop uh, after a, a particular Fedora release where we had. A, Internally at Red Hat, decided, okay, we're going to start. We're going to halt here and 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 uh, prepare this to be the next Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Uh, generally, we would we would pick a Fedora release on its release day. We would then uh, we would then uh, take a snapshot essentially of of disk git for all of the packages that we intended to have in Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Copy that internally. And then spend about the next six months, sometimes up to uh, up to nine months, preparing to bootstrap uh, Rel, or not preparing to, but actively trying to bootstrap Rel from that Fedora release, uh, which was extremely time-consuming and very very painful for those of us, me, who had to do it. And a large a large part of that was because, you know, Fedora being what it is, it's always looking to the future, it's always expanding. It always has the newest and latest tools, and as thing as these things go, sometimes it's not possible to build its it build itself from its current state. So that was not a great situation uh, because, yeah, it took six nine months, a good chunk of a, of time to uh, to turn Fedora into something that we could use to start to hand to the developers to start building RHEL. So we wanted, and now uh, as of RHEL 8, they announced that uh, future versions of RHEL, RHEL 9, which is, uh, is in beta right now and, and onwards, we're going to be coming out every three years on a schedule, not when we get, not 
when it's done, as it was in the past, we would sli slip and slip and slip, and it would just, you know, the, the gap between rel 7 and rel 8 was, uh, well, I'm sure some of you have, have, have uh, raised children into, into school age in that time. <clears throat> So with only three years to uh, with, with only three years to work with, spending six months just getting it started it was not going to work. So a few of us, uh, most uh, mostly uh, Alexandra Fedorova and myself, and a couple and a couple of others in the uh, bo in the bootstrapping team, sat down and tried to figure out how can we shorten that bootstrapping time. How can we make that work better and at some point and i don't actually remember which of us initially had the idea um but we decided that the easiest thing to do would be to never stop bootstrapping essentially take a take a project create a project in fedora land whose purpose was to, to continuously bootstrap enterprise linux so when uh, and so when we started this, uh, we gave it a, we gave it a code name project that eventually turned uh, turned into ELN. Um, it was El Nino, uh, which is which was a multi-layered uh, uh, set of reference uh, references and in jokes. Uh, of course, ELL -L -L, uh, is the distribution tag for RHEL and CentOS for enterprise Linux. Nino is the uh, is the Spanish word for a male child, uh, so the the implication in that was that this is the project that is the immature version of what will grow up into enterprise Linux, and then also El Nino is a type of weather pattern that occurs every three or four years and pretty much always brings storms in with it. So I think that reference should be fairly obvious. Uh, a lot of a, a lot of furious uh, activity tends to happen in both the Fedora and RHEL communities right around the time that we are heading towards a release. So, what is ELN itself? Uh, it's a it's no longer El Nino. We we kind of backronymed it to be Enterprise Linux Next, and it's. An attempt to make an early early preview, kind of a, kind of an alpha, but more of a pre-alpha of what the next uh, major uh, you know a major version of Rel Rel 10 Rel 11 Rel 12, Rel 12. Hopefully, I'll be retired by Rel 13. Um, will look like and main, and uh, then try to maintain those changes and keep them up to date and making sure that they build in Fedora. So, how are we doing this? Well. For the, uh, for a great many packages actually just build as is against RHEL, which is great. Those are the easy ones. But there are a number of packages that are maintained in, in Fedora that are, con are conditionalized so that they would build in RHEL or Apple uh, differently than they would build in Fedora. Now, for a lot of, uh, so some of the cases uh, for that might be, you might be uh, in RHEL, in Fedora, you're okay with including uh, experimental or unstable plugins or optional uh, optional features that you know a niche group of people might use. But in RHEL, you know, you maybe just want to maintain only the pieces that the majority of people will use and that aren't likely to break and cause a lot of support uh, costs. So maybe you you conditionalize your package for that. Maybe you conditionalize it to reduce your dependencies, which is a big thing in RHEL, oh, because we, the, every package we ship, we have to support at Red Hat. So reducing that number is always a, a goal. We also build uh, sometimes in Enterprise Linux with different compiler baselines and different op uh, compiler optimizations or, sim or similar functionality. So we would, so in ELN, we always track, and sometimes ahead of, uh, the intended uh, baselines and optimizations for uh, for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And uh, another very common one is that with the ELN and RHEL, oftentimes we try to package pre-built documentation, which is kind, which is in general a no-no in Fedora because we always want to make sure that it's up to date and regenerated. But in in Red Hat. Uh, 
oftentimes the the document documentation builds in Fedora are responsible for some of the longest dependency chains the redistribution. I mean, if you were to if you were to uh, look at the dependency chain of any basic Python module without built without uh, building its documentation. And the dependency chain of it, when you have Python, when, when you have Python Sphinx documentation built, it is three orders of magnitude longer. <clears throat> so that's one of those things that we very, very aggressively try to remove from RHEL. And so we can start, we can start doing some of that months and months, maybe even years in advance when we do it in uh, enterprise in ELN, Red Hat ELN, uh, Fedora ELN. Goodness. Uh, so. That allows us to make a bunch of uh, just rel specific ish changes, but for the most part, we try not to disrupt Fedora itself. We do a re we do a series of rebuilds uh, through our through the same Koji instance, but we do them uh, triggered by a bot that follow that follows along and does not uh, it does not uh, block Fedora packages if the uh, ELN package is not building or is or is failing its tests, so that we don't inter so that we don't significantly uh, interfere with or delay the development of Fedora. But in general, uh, any package that is in the uh, what we've declared the rel content set uh, is rebuilt automatically in, from Fedora rawhide every time a Fedora rawhide build is triggered is completed. Uh, or more to the point, it's actually whenever that build is tagged. Into the uh, com candidate tag for or for inclusion in the next compose. Uh, don't need to go into the specifics of that, I suppose. Um, lost my train of thought for a moment. But uh, so, what uh, ELN is also essentially. The point, it, the, the point from which we will fork uh, the next version of CentOS Stream, which is where, which is the open environment where we will, uh, where uh, Red Hat will do development for Red Hat Enterprises Linux N plus one. In Fedora, uh, so, uh, what, when we were doing this uh, in Fedora 30, uh, sorry, for RHEL 9, we broke inheritance at the final freeze of Fedora 34. So we had a stable, Fixed uh, set of uh, set of uh, commits that we could then say, okay, these are going to get moved into the CentOS stream uh, distgit repositories, uh, trimmed for a sort of uh, legal re reasons. Uh, the, the history, rather, is trimmed a, a bit so that we don't have to get uh, so that we. Uh, it, that's complicated. I should probably leave that one out. Um, so during that process. Uh, if you were tar if you were working towards rel 9 you would build you would do your work on rawhide first uh, rawhide for most of the time until we got to fedora 34 branched and then people who were trying to target to rel would be working on fedora 34 branched for a bit about a month month and a half and then switch over to centos stream 9 well it did turn out that we uh that that was an awful lot of churn and, confu and confusion reigned from that. So starting with uh, RHEL 10, which we intend, uh, intend and expect to branch from Fedora 40, um, we're going to do the uh, we're going to do the CentOS Stream uh, fork off at uh, the at the Fedora 40 branch point as opposed to the uh, later freeze. Uh, so the point the point there being will be from uh, from now on. Any non CentOS stream, you know, directly rel work will go will be going into rawhide, and only rawhide will be it will be will need uh, dealt with that until we get to CentOS stream. Um, ELN will always track rawhide. We've already uh, moved on uh, to developing rel 10 ELN. We've got we've made some uh, interesting progress there, and we are. Experimenting with a variety of uh, of, uh, of things, including but not limited to the uh, x86 64 v3 compiler baseline, some uh, some new uh, compiler flags related to link time optimization and similar. And uh, we're also we're also monitoring uh, through the con the uh, content resolver service 
um, how our dependency trees are growing or sh or shrinking and trying to keep that headed towards the uh, sm the smaller side of things. But we are generally these days we have a, we are, have a compose most days that succeeds. Um, every once in a while, like just this past uh, week, we had a per an extended period where uh, the where ELN's compose was broken for esoteric reasons, but uh, in general, it's available. Uh, we've got contrib contributors from uh, Datto, from Amazon, from, uh, I believe we had some from IBM, some from, I think, I think we had somebody from Lenovo, who have all been actively working with us to get uh, new functionality and uh, tweaks into the uh, ELN systems. So. It's been uh, fairly effective. It's been fairly. It's been uh, a pleasure to work with everyone, and I think that pretty much sums up the explanation. So maybe we should uh, next move on to just any questions and what uh, what you want to, more you might might want to know about uh, ELN. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen because with blue jeans, that's the only way I can see your faces when you ask questions. <laughs> Still being shared, there we go. And I've put us all into gallery view. You can see we've got a small audience uh, today, but um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll put this online so more people can see it as well. Um, I've got a couple questions. Does anyone else have ones to start? I'll throw one out there. So is ELN usable as like a, you know, you could, like, do we build a, like an installer compose and actually install it on a machine that and like an anti-goal for the project? So we do produce an installable, an installable compose. Um, I have on a couple of occasions installed it into a virtual machine successfully. So, um, it is not at this time an active goal to make sure that that, uh, that, that is uh, necessarily installable. Uh, we generally stop at present because we, uh, by lack of resources, we stop at, is it capable of booting the installer? That's, the, that's our uh, minimum viable product as far as I'm concerned. Uh, whether it successfully installs, that's, that's a problem that, uh, that, the, that really requires a, a subject matter expert to deal with past sure. that. There are a number of users though that have gone to a, from a Fedora base to ELN, um, you know, done a system upgrade online that way, which tends to kind of work. Originally, that's what we were recommending people do as well. Uh, if they, you know, if they wanted to work on it with a container, we never, I or I never at least expected anyone to attempt this on their laptop, um, and I'm both uh, surprised and pleased by the number of them that have actually pulled that off. So. Yeah, the only I, note for people hearing this and thinking they might want to try that is they probably should start with a uh, minimal Fedora install and then move over from there so you're not bringing in a bunch of depths and end up with a hybrid system. Good advice. A Frankenstein system. I, I, I've got a couple like smaller technical questions and then some big questions. Uh, the first one, highly technical, is does the ELN build bot have some sort of punny name? And if not, why not, given everything else? Um, it actually does. Uh, I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, 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 we're actually using the same uh, the same uh, build bot that uh, that mirrors content from CentOS Stream to uh, RHEL internally. So, uh, it, and it is referred to as the Distro Baker. Um, oh, all right. So, uh, we which which was so named because uh, as kind of a joke that stuck, the uh, bootstrapping team internal to Red Hat uh, for RHEL eight uh, named it uh, named itself the Bakery. Uh, so naturally, when we came, when we had to build a bot, it became the Distro Baker. That that's better than a lot of possible alternatives along those lines. Um, 
the other question, this one actually is more technical. Uh, so there are these rel conditionals, basically choices in packages that are rel specific. Mm -hmm. um, is there a process to review those as things go forward and see if they were there for some, you know, reason related to some weird thing in, you know, rel six and uh, remove and clean those up? Is that part of ELN scope? It is definitely in scope. It is not something we have had the resources to do yet. Um, it, generally speaking, that's going to be a task that we're going to need the maintainer to be involved with. And our, so far, what we've been, uh, our focus has been heavily on making sure that it is stabilized enough that uh, it's that uh, that maintainers could start to care about it more. Uh, right now, our, right now, our best our, our Best intention is to make sure that the ma the maintainer doesn't notice that we're doing it, or you know, it doesn't impact, it doesn't negatively impact them. We then we want to move to having them uh, take advantage of it for improve for inc improving their ability to get something into RHEL. And actually segues into one of my other questions, which is um, when this project was you talked about and proposed. One of the goals I know was to make sure there were no downsides or minimal downsides for average Fedora Linux packagers who might not care about RHEL. Um, in practice, how has that worked out? Like what, uh, you have people seen disruptions? Have there been things that need to be adjusted? There have been, uh, there have been some adjust, uh, adjustments made, uh, mostly because we just didn't realize in some cases that uh, people would get notifications on certain events. And we had to we had to work with Relenge to uh, to reduce that fire hose, uh, but for the most part we've actually been pretty Narrator, successful. Narrator, it was a lot of notifications. <laughs> <laughs> I did use the word fire hose, did I not? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. um, but that was that was a definitely a bug to be worked out, not a uh, design choice. <laughs> so on the other side of that same coin. Uh, are there advantages for Fedora maintainers who don't necessarily care about RHEL? Is there a benefit or is it sort of um, neutral is the best we can hope for? Well, I guess it's, it partially depends on whether or not they don't care about RHEL, but does RHEL care about them? Uh, because if it's, a, you know, if we've got a packager for something that is central to RHEL, like for example, Bash, that isn't maintained by a Red Hat maintainer. I mean, Bash probably is. I haven't looked. I'm just pulling a, num a name out of a hat. But uh, then it is entirely possible that uh, ELED will become relevant to them, if only because RHEL maintainers will start make, uh, pr proposing or pushing changes into it. Uh, direct, but a direct benefit to them. I think it's hard. I think it's hard to uh, claim one uh, off the cuff. I'd have to give that some more thought. But I don't. Uh, but in general, I think the best we can hope for is not antagonizing anyone. Uh, all right. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, there there is the advantage of of rel maintainers suddenly actually care about Fedora, um, mm. you know, in, in that aspect, um, and and they do. You know, they'll go and fix bugs that maybe you haven't had time to get to or those things upstream because they're going to affect rel as well. Um, the question remains is, you know, how is that going to last, right? It, it's obviously died off quite a bit with the uh, current rel cycle. Uh, you know, before we've always had in Fedora, before every rel release is branched, we suddenly have interest from rel maintainers and, and developers, and then they disappear. Um, I think that the process is going to be better now because there's notification and uh, things like that, but it, how much better remains to be, and how much does that end up benefiting yeah. Fedora? And a piece of that too is going to be uh, working to change the uh, the culture inside of Red Hat to be to care more about that because instead of instead of before it was a hand wavy, eh, eventually for the Fedora will become something you care about. It's now we're trying to get people to recognize Fedora ELN as being this is what you need to be caring about because this specific thing is what's going to uh, come to bite you later. So fix it now and save yourself a lot of headaches. Yeah, that inter intermittent caring has always been a problem where uh, you know, a lot of times you know, Red Hat doesn't even pay it you know, for a while, hadn't paid attention for like four years and then suddenly cared a whole lot, uh, maybe um, in a kind of overbearing way sometimes. So hopefully this will reduce that. Uh, but I guess that I recall a certain pizza metaphor involved there. Right. Uh, this this does 
it, that, thus bakery, right? Um, this, uh, but this goes, um, yeah, actually, we're, we're doing a good job of leading into the questions that I noted. Um, <laughs> so uh, one of the things I'm concerned about is that you mentioned um, branching to ELN at the F40 fork. Um, so it's about nine months from that hap when that happens until the F40 um, release happens. Um, so once that is branched, how do you keep people's attention on you know, on the Fedora side of things when you know rel demands are coming on the other side? How to realistically, um, a lot of them, uh, a lot of uh, there will probably be a few uh, six month uh, dip in uh, in activity there, but not necessarily because there are plenty of packagers and uh, plenty of maintainers in uh, rel land that are going to be still trying to trying to keep their fedora stuff in sync because they want to catch they want to uh pull something in past uh the f40 you know so, uh, there there are, i'm sure there's plenty of stuff that, hap that will still happen in the kernel uh, just as justin can attest and i'm sure that there are plenty of other packages too that will continue to be developed on rawhide and may yet be pulled over and so caring about it in rawhide means that the uh, that that's that pulling that in down the line becomes much easier yeah, kernel is typically not part of the branch, and it never has yeah. been. Uh, every time they branch Fedora for a rail release, they they branch user space, but then kernel keeps going. They set a, a target upstream kernel version that they're going to fork over, which is what happened this time. It, it was months after. And does that rail kernel now come uh, derive from the Fedora kernel? The um. source RPM for uh, Rawhide will build a rail kernel and will build a um, right, so when it's built against ELN, it builds a rel kernel. It's completely different. So uh, that's actually a big change from the kernel in uh, even up to rel eight, right? Uh, yes. Rel seven for sure, where it, it, the kernel actually was kind of disconnected from Fedora completely. Yeah. So they they used to branch. Um, they would branch the Fedora kernel and then. You know, kind of maintain it completely separately at that point. Uh, and at that point, they may or may not pick up some of the spec changes and those things we've made. Uh, one of the advantages to, to this setup is now, you know, all the spec changes, everything is happening in ARC, which is the ELN kernel and, and Fedora kernel. And uh, there, there are some disadvantages to it from a Fedora standpoint and some advantages, but the disadvantages are not so bad. Uh, we end up with a, a pretty good trade-off. So there are patches that are rel specific and have no relevance to Fedora. Uh, By policy now, those are all hidden behind a uh, config rel differences. And so even though the code is there, um, it, unless you are building a rel kernel, it doesn't actually, um, you know, it, the, the code path taken isn't there. And then when we branch for Fedora stable releases, I go through and remove those things just because so much of our support model, uh, given the the single maintainer uh, of, of kernel is, you, you've got to be able to go upstream. So people need to be able to apply patches that they're given uh, or uh, yeah, revert patches, things like that, without having uh, a bunch of, of noise in the way that might, especially non-developers, make it more difficult for them to interact with upstream. <laughs> Uh, one quick, and I uh, should point pause. I'm going to interject before your interjection. Ha ha. Uh, I should introduce Justin um, here, who is Fedora kernel maintainer for a very long time and does a lot of other things and has done a lot of other things in Fedora. Right, yeah, that's including uh, being one of the founding members of the ELN SIG. Uh, I was just going to uh, mention Justin. Did, uh, I think twice during that talk, uh, that, that uh, statement, you mentioned ARC. Uh, without pre without a preamble, so you may, for the benefit of anyone who isn't familiar with that acronym, you might want right. to clarify. So that that acronym and and that actually probably should be changed at some point. There's been a lot of discussion about it. It's supposed to stand for Always Ready Kernel, um, and and it started as an internal rel thing, and uh, you know they they wanted to have essentially a modern kernel. Turns out it's it's hard to keep up, and you're not doing that day to day. And we were already doing it for rawhides, so. Uh, yeah, Kind of made sense there, and like I said, there have been a, bu a bunch of advantages to that setup too. Um, you know, it, it's we do have kernel developers actively looking at things, uh, you know, pretty 
consistently. Even after the rel 9 kernels branch, there are still people there. Um, one of the ways that that's done is because the rel configs are there, uh, they have to be reviewed as they come in. And so that gets people looking at, at the new things coming in. Um, for Fedora, everything is, the configs are kept differently and there are several things in there that allow me to do builds for Fedora um, without having to wait for rel process. So like if we have a compile bug or something of that nature that, that really has to be fixed, I've got a patch for it. I don't have to wait to get permission to put it in. We have a, a process where essentially it goes into disk git so we can build with it, but it doesn't go into the tree until it gets approved. That makes sense. Um, uh, Steven, you mentioned uh, uh, that the fork kind of goes, goes, it flows to CentOS stream at some point. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the relationship? Is that kind of a handoff to CentOS stream? How does the build or bakery team stay involved on both sides there? How yes. does that? So the, yeah. Yes, uh, the bake, well, the former, the, the team formerly known as the bakery, um, now uh, generally known as the uh, emerging rel team. Uh, works uh, on the Fedora side. Uh, our, you know, uh, our uh, avatar is the is Fedora ELN, and we are also heavily involved with the CentOS Stream project. And in fact, we we contribute to on both sides. We kind of straddle that line. So yeah, uh, we we spent uh, I'd say probably about eight months. Uh, Smoothing the way for uh, for rel uh, rel nine over on that side, for shifting our our uh, primary focus again back to uh to ELN to prep for rel ten. I guess so. Uh, is that focus likely to be a wave between the two projects of focus, or is there? Um, it's going to be a wave in the same sense that the, uh, the waves crashing on the beach are a wave. Some of them will be larger, some of them will be smaller, and, uh, and they will be entirely unpredictable. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, it, will, it will not be a nice, clean uh, sine wave. So what about Fedora Server, which is something I, I know is, is dear to you? Um, when, when we set that up, um, one of the things we wanted to do was make that kind of a clear upstream for the RHEL Server product. Um, is that still kind of in the plans? Um, is that, and how does you know the the emerging rel team work with with you know the Fedora Server Working Group? Um, and how how does that all connect? So you're right that that was the initial intention of the Fedora Server Group, and ultimately it. Uh, I'll, I'll be frank. Uh, we failed in large part because we didn't have something like ELN. Uh, at the time, or have the, even the the beginnings of an idea for something like ELN uh, to uh, to work from. We didn't have the ability to change our configuration specifically to build the Fedora server. We we had we were working under the same constraints that we were before, which was we can make small configuration changes, but not package level changes uh, to to what we shipped in in Fedora server. Um, with that, with that, plus the fact that, that that back at that time we were still dealing with the with this uncertainty about, you know, rel. Uh, while being an open open source operating system, Red Hat Enterprise Linux was developed in a fairly proprietary way once it once it forked off of Fedora. We, I mean, the sources became available when we shipped them, and uh, you know, we accept contributions into Fedora, but it was there was no clear pipeline for someone who wasn't a Red Hatter to get a patch through that entire system. And I think uh, now we have a much better story with, about that with uh, ELN and CentOS Stream. So I guess that um, leads me to another question about your kind of governance and decision-making at the engineering level in ELN. So this is one of the things that I think is a clear distinction between the CentOS Stream Thing and sent and Fedora project, which is you know, Fedora in Fedora. Although there are a lot of redheaders involved, if Fedora makes the engineering decision, our headline um, thing for that being the ButterFS change, right? Um, those are those are made 
you know, um, with input from Red Hat for some things, but independently. Um, and then CentOS Stream is set up basically, you know, as CentOS Linux was before, all of the engineering decisions are you know, for around the, the main CentOS Linux were made by Red Hat, even though CentOS branded, Red Hat made the decisions. And if CentOS Linux came out with something that wasn't like RHEL, that was a bug, like the decisions, it wasn't supposed to deviate. And CentOS Stream kind of follows that same thing. The engineering decisions, even though it's a community project, the ultimate decisions, you know, come, it's, it's more of a, we welcome your input and patches accepted kind of open source project, whereas Fedora is a, you know, uh, you make the you see where I'm going here. Where where does ELN fit into that? If I am somebody who is not a Red Hatter but very gets very involved, like you mentioned, there were non Red Hatters involved. Like, can they ultimately? How, how much voice do they have? So, I'm going to tell you the truth, which may get me in trouble. All right, um, that's that's what we like. <laughs> which is that realistically uh, and practically. Red Hat cannot say no to uh, what is coming, what comes into CentOS Stream from Fedora. So if you have something somewhat controversial or just uh, plain brand new, Fedora ELN, Fedora and Fedora ELN are the place to push for that. It may require, it'll require you to work earlier in the process, but it is effectively a way to bypass the bureaucracy inherent in uh, trying to get your changes into CentOS Stream. Uh, now, I, I say bureaucracy, and I, I know that carries a negative connotation, but it's also very important for making sure that things get reviewed, that nothing gets, that nothing is uh, being supported that is difficult or impossible to actually maintain, actually do so for. Um, I, I, I liken the uh, CentOS stream po uh, policy to, uh, and maybe this is a bad analogy these days, but uh, to uh, choosing a Supreme Court justice for the U.S. Uh, government. CentOS stream contributors uh, nominate a change, but it has, but, and Red Hat acts as the uh, advice and consent for that change. Yeah, let's, let's not um, touch the um, third rail on going further on that analogy. <laughs> I, I am but, speaking merely on how it is supposed to work. It has been uh, an interesting issue, and it's actually something that, that's actively being discussed right now on kernel, because that's one place where people have been trying to get changes in. Uh, particularly the hyperscale SIG on uh, on the CentOS side is, you know, they've got code changes they wanted. Um, the the instance that kicked it off was they wanted um, some code updated from upstream and a driver that's turned off in RHEL, right? The, the config is turned off. Um, the SIG would be building that module and supporting it, but they wanted it in the RHEL tree. And there are advantages and disadvantages to that. Um, so there was some discussion about how do we take that? How do we worry about, you know, do we have to worry about this chunk of code that doesn't interact? And a, a decision really hasn't been made yet on uh, what a firm policy would be, but I, I've heard, uh, you know, a good bit of discussion around it's a lot of it's going to be up to the engineer's uh, discretion, right? If it's a dead code path, are they willing to take that and, and maintain that stuff? Um, you know, obviously getting anything turned on your, or adding a package or something like that, if it's if it's in RHEL, it's supported. So there has to be an engineer behind it that, that supports it. But even for, you know, for other things where you could, you know, I, I'd like this code in there, uh, there might be a path. It, it's, it is being discussed. It's just too new to, to really have a policy yet. I mean, it's not it's not impossible that a controversial change made into in Fedora ELN will be backed out when it gets to CentOS Stream, or but it is a lot more effort to do that than it is to get to uh, figure out how to maintain it. So still, your your best bet is if you want to get something in that's uh, maybe a little risky or a little controversial, do it in Fedora first. I, I would I, say I, early. How about early is the way to do it, right? Um, sure. I think. And it's a way to it's a way to influence bigger changes, um, and also have them proved and tested before they're actually hitting the rel level of. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I probably should have called that out, but uh, flipped my mind. Um, I've got a, one or two more things. Does anybody else have questions? I know there's other people, still other people on the call here. I'll throw another one out there. Um, so, what do you? 
Like, how do you define success for ELN, and do you think you're achieving it right now? Uh, I define success for ELN as Red Hat continues to pay me, and so I'm still working for Red Hat, therefore I'm successful. <laughs> now, uh, in all seriousness, uh, we will prove success when, uh, you know, around the Fedora 40 branch period where we will figure, where we will know for certain, has this all worked and can we basically jump straight from Fedora 40 branch to uh, developers can start working on RHEL, you know, give, a, give or take a week or two and rather than six months. And I think uh, with RHEL 9, uh, we 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 had a great deal of success there. I think we uh, we took that six months down to something like seven weeks. Uh, on that, so that's yeah, pretty that, good. Yeah, that was that was a, a big win, and I think we can do better uh, for Rel 10. I think we uh, we're going to be working a lot on some automations uh, stuff that uh, some additional automation that should make it a lot easier. So I think that's how we'll define success: is that we are essentially automating ourselves out of a job. Oh, there's plenty of jobs for you. Don't worry. Uh, so I guess um, my, my fi final questions, uh, the first one is, yeah, oh, yeah, you talked a little bit about what, what the plans are coming ahead. Um, what are the big things, uh, or, or are there big things that will affect things from the Fedora side, uh, or is it mostly you're going to implement on the roadmap of, you know, the RHEL 10 development and that's it, or are there more big changes in store? Um. I am. A, I can only speak for myself in this case, not specifically for the entire ELN SIG. But I am very strongly backing the uh, the packet and source kit horse, and I think that uh, we're going to we're going to be see, we're going to want to see an awful lot more of that happening uh, in the ELN space, and that's going to and that and that will naturally filter to the uh, raw into rawhide as well. So that's there, there's a lot of potential there, uh, and I've been playing around with the uh, packet source kit for some time now uh, on just a few of my, my packages. And I think there are still some rough edges, but I'd like, what I really want to get to is an is a point where a Fedora contributor can take a patch from upstream, slap it on the, slap it, uh, commit it to a source kit repository, and everything after that is automated. Everything after that, from uh, you know, from getting, from building it in Koji to uh, to preparing it for uh, for a uh, an errata update in Bodhi, to uh, d delivering it, and to also to tr preparing it downstream for Rel 10 or 11, uh, all of that, um, I think, should be essentially just just happen once a commit once the uh, commit is pushed. Possibly some sort of human review of whether it works. Well, at, at well a human, the human review would have to take place before the push to source kit. We would have to have CI and 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 uh, review that was very thorough. So that there's I'm working, the, the OSCI team is also very heavily uh, involved in the project. I I think that's a I, I'm excited to see that too. So I'll. I'll It'd be interesting to watch that. It's, it's uh, ambitious, guess, I'm aware. The final question is, uh, what can we as the Fedora Council do to help ELN succeed? Oof, uh, that's a good question. Um, nope. Talking us up, uh, it never hurts. Lost your audio? Does that? That's just you. Is it? I heard him. Okay. Yeah, yep. you're fine, Stephen. Maybe it's on my side. Okay. Um, the question was, uh, what can the council do to help? Uh, very much, I think, we uh, helping us uh, get our name out there, let people help help us uh, communicate what we're trying to do, and especially, uh, I think one of the best things we can do. We talked a little bit earlier about uh, how sometimes there are maintainers in Fedora that don't match the uh, maintainers in Rel, and that they there is perhaps some friction uh, around, you know, in those months leading up to Rel, to the Rel release. I want to, since we want to be trying to change that internally, I think we also want to be uh, making, communicating that out externally that to maintainers that uh, you're probably, if we do this right, you are going to see more, uh, more contribution and more, uh, and more churn throughout the process. And I think we need to work 
very hard on uh, breaking that age, those ages old uh, tendencies to think of the package as mine. Uh, to, to remember that you are a steward, not a uh, shepherd, if you will. Yeah, um, I guess I, I I asked for what we could do, so I will take that that part of it. But I also want to. Um, there's always a balance there between you know ownership and pride and that that like the um, there's a, a tragedy of the commons problem that can happen when when something doesn't when it belongs to everybody and then it belongs to nobody and nobody cares and so a lot of these packages where people have that mine feeling also means they they're kind of invested in that and uh, taking that oh, away from people is um, hard so there's a balance there to figure out and I don't sure. actually know exactly how to strike that especially with this um, <laughs> you don't have to have an answer to that that's, yeah, that's why I, that's that's why I asked for door council to take it over yeah <laughs> it over. Um, it's something something to work on so I guess that a general idea of you know shared shared responsibility for things um, and uh, maybe Figuring out, you know, when when there are disagreements, you know, I know some people don't like to have any conditionals in their spec files, like how to figure out how to to the, those kind of um, right. That that, come up. that was a that was actually uh, thank you for bringing that up. That was a topic that uh, was very heated when the ELN uh, SIGs first started, um, and in fact, to date there have been almost. 400 more emails about the topic than there have been actual conditionals added to spec <laughs> files to to adapt to ELN. Okay, that's uh, <laughs> we, we're we're we'll, we're well prepared for if a situation arises. We've already discussed it. Uh, um, I mean, well, realistically, people thought it was going to be much more intrusive than it was, and I and uh, did not initially believe our protestations that we were going to try and stay out of their way, and I think. Our actions have spoken much louder than our words, because I haven't heard a complaint about that in months. That's good to hear. That kind of goes back to what, one of my first questions, too. Um, all right, is there anything else? OK, well, thank you very much, Justin and Stephen. Uh, ben, this is the time of the call where I put you on the spot. Are, are you? Yeah. Yes, the, this is the part of the call where I forgot that I should have the tab open ready to. It's a little comedy routine we do because I do this every time, and then every time I feel bad because Ben is surprised. Uh, what what's uh, coming so up <laughs> next month, April fourteenth? Uh, we have Leonardo Rossetti and others talking about the Cube Dev Sig. Okay, that'll be interesting. Anything anything after that, or are we looking for more? Oh. There are items on the wish list. Nothing has been scheduled because we're not doing one in May because of the release party. So and we haven't the scheduled, wonderfully on-time release. Okay, so um, if people are interested in, uh, wow, June seems so far off, but I guess it's not. All right, um, they'll be. We'll see you in the future, I guess. Thank you again, and goodbye, everybody. Thanks.